thanks everybody for coming out today. Um, this is an interactive session, and it means that if you have a question, you put up your hand, and we will stop and we'll uh, address that question. If it's, if it's something I'm going to come on to later on in the presentation, I'll say, oh, I'm just coming to that. If I think we should park it until the end, then I'll just say that as well. But do feel free to ask any questions uh, during the presentation because you may not remember them when we get to the end. <laughs> I will try to speak as, uh, as uh, uh, intelligibly as possible. Um, I only have a few slides, about 120. Um, so I'm going to also record this for YouTube. Mm. Uh, so that uh, you, it saves you having to take notes, it saves you having to take photographs. You can take photographs of any of the, the slides if you want to, but it is going to be on YouTube on my um, uh, YouTube channel, which is called DNA and Family Tree Research. So if you just Google YouTube, DNA and Family Tree Research, you'll find my channel, and this will be uh, the next video up on that channel. Uh, I'll put it up sometime over the weekend. So uh, if you miss anything today or you happen to nod off for a few uh, seconds, then you'll be able to see it again and again and again in the comfort of your own home on YouTube. And that's particularly useful for those Farrells who are not with us today because they weren't able to make the Silver Jubilee uh, clan rally. So uh, that is um, going to be a service uh, or a resource that the Farrell clan can then make use of for years to come. Um, I myself am a Farrell. Uh, my great 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 grandmother was a Farrell. She came from Kildare. So when Sam Hanna, who's uh, my co administrator on the DNA project, came to me a few years ago and said, Do you know anything about the Farrells and what we can do with their DNA? Um, I was immediately interested because I have uh, Farrell interests um, on my great 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 grandmother's side, and she came from Kildare. So how she got to Kildare remains a little bit of a mystery, and I'm not sure where my Farrells actually come from. So I'm going to talk about several things today, but just to tell you a little bit about how I got into DNA in the first place, um, uh, I'm a medical doctor, a psychiatrist, a pharmaceutical physician, a professional actor, and now I'm a genetic genealogist. <coughs> and it all started about 12 years ago, after my mum passed away, my uh, dad was on his own in the family home and I thought I need a project to do with him so I can phone him up from London three times a week and say, are you okay, are you okay, are you okay? Without sounding like I'm phoning him up three times a week to ask him if he's okay. <laughs> so I thought, well, he's been doing the family tree on and off for 30 years. Why don't I suggest that we do a little bit of work on the family tree together? And he thought, oh, that's a great idea. And we, we reconnected with cousins he hadn't seen in 60 years. We went over to Los Angeles to meet cousins we'd never met before. He got 20 letters from his mother that were written 90 years ago. Oh. So it just opened up all of these new uh, fantastic adventures for the two of us. And it also um, gave him a new social outlet that helped him get over the, the loss of, of my mum. Uh, so he's turning 90 in uh, September. Um, he's still very much interested in the family tree, but uh, he's given a lot of it over to me. And of course, uh, when DNA came out, I, I got myself two kits and I thought, uh, actually, why don't I give them as a present to my dad for Christmas? Because I'm terrible at Christmas presents. I never know what to buy. So I gave them to my dad at Christmas and I thought, um, uh, this would be good because whatever results he gets from his DNA will apply to me too, because you know I'm his son. Then I thought, how do I know he's my father? <laughs> because I could be, a, how would you know if you were a secret adoption? Well, you wouldn't because you're, it's, a, it's a secret. And so I kind of said, well, happy Christmas, Dad. <laughs> and just hoped for the best. And as it turned out, later on, I discovered that he was my father. And we have genetic proof to actually uh, prove that. But it does mean that DNA testing comes with a government health warning. You may find surprises. You may find half-siblings that you never knew existed. You may find that you were adopted. You may find that there has been a surname or a DNA switch at the level of your grandparents. Um, so that is, that's the government health warning. It does come with uh, some caution. 
and especially if you're going to be testing other members of your family, you have to advise them that there may be surprises and are they okay if they find some surprises. And um, most people are, but it's, it's important to be aware of the, um, the po potential for these surprises as well. So that's just by way of introduction. Um, I do have some DNA kits with me here today. So if anybody does want to do any DNA testing, uh, these are the family tree DNA kits. I'll explain during the presentation uh, what my recommendation is for uh, the various companies. I'm not a associated with any of the various companies at all. I tend to work quite closely with Family Tree DNA because they're very kind sponsors of the DNA lectures we have at the RDS in October every, um, every year. Uh, we have DNA lectures there and we have three days of uh, speakers uh, talking about all aspects of uh, genetic genealogy. So uh, do come to Dublin if you have a chance. I'll be covering the, the Farrell name and historical context. I'll give you an overview of DNA for genealogy and how it can be a useful tool. I'll be talking specifically then about the Farrell DNA project and the DNA results. Do they match what the historical texts say? There's, there's, so Ireland has the oldest genealogies in Europe. And we actually have historical texts, the ancient annals that go back, even before the origin of surnames, uh, back into the 900s, 800s, 700s, round about to about 200, 300 uh, AD. <coughs> so we have this wonderful, uh, rich heritage, genealogical heritage. And uh, one of the questions is, do the DNA results actually match what are written in the ancient annals? So we'll be looking at that. Uh, or do they tell us something different? And then where do we go next? Uh, what's the next step with the project? So those are the topics to be covered. DNA is associated with uh, all of them. Um, DNA can be associated with a specific uh, location. You may find that people from a specific geographical location and only that location share a particular DNA marker. It's also associated with surnames, of course. And some surnames uh, have specific DNA markers just like the Farrell surname has specific DNA markers. DNA also tells us about the tree of mankind and the evolution of human beings from when they first arose in Africa 250,000 years ago right down to the Farrells living today. So by doing a Y DNA test, we can trace uh, the line that our ancestors took out of Africa going back 250,000 years ago. It's also associated with the historical texts, and in the last 10 years or so, there's been some great research done on the O'Briens, for example. So we've identified a DNA marker uh, for Brian Baru. Uh, we've also identified a DNA marker that would have been, um, uh, nine of the nine hostages would have had this DNA marker. Uh, he would not be the first person to carry this DNA marker, but he would be a descendant of the per first person that carried that DNA marker. Um, and of course, it's associated with, uh, with family trees. So how many people here have actually done a DNA test? So that's quite a few. One, two, three, four, five, six, about 20, I'd say. About 20 people have done a DNA test. And um, uh, how many people have made a breakthrough <coughs> in their genealogy through DNA? So quite a few people, about 10, 15 people have actually made a breakthrough. So it can be a very useful additional tool for your family tree research. Um, when we're talking about the Farrell surname and historical context, we need to ask ourselves three questions. When did it arise? Where did it come from? And where did it spread to? And to help us with this, there are a variety of different sources that we can use for any uh, surname research, really. But these are the, um, uh, most, what, the ones that I use most. Obviously, there's general sources like, you know, you can Google your surname, you can find it on Wikipedia. Uh, you have to take everything that you, you see on the internet with a pinch of salt because it's not always true. Um, the surname dictionaries, uh, Wolf and MacLyset, O'Hart and Grenham, I use Wolf a lot because I find he's actually much more comprehensive than MacLyset and they're available online. Uh, so if you actually search, we'll be looking at Wolf uh, and what he says about the Farrells. There are surname distribution maps and we'll be looking at some of those as well. And then there's learned texts, because there were various Farrell scholars throughout the ages, 
We have one sitting here with us today. I won't mention your name, Sam Hanna. And um, uh, there's also, of course, academic journals. So these are a great uh, source of previous research into the feral surname. Uh, in terms of the ancient annals, a lot of them are surprisingly online. So the annals of the Four Masters is online. Um, Roger O'Farrell's Linea Antiqua, so one of our own, um, did the Linea Antiqua, which listed a lot of the genealogies of the old Irish families, including the Farrell family. And that was copied across by Hart into his book, Irish Pedigrees are the Origin and Stem of the Irish Nation. And that's available online as well, and we'll be looking at that. Then uh, in 2013, Bart Yasky uh, published genealogical tables of the medieval royal Irish royal dynasties. And they're very, very comprehensive. Uh, he's a, Dutch, uh, a Dutchman, uh, but he's uh, got a huge interest in Irish genealogy. And he has uh, published 76 pages of family trees based on the ancient annals. And he looked at about 40 of these ancient annals. Um, that was the part of his thesis. The last one there is unfortunately not available online. It's called Leawar Mor Nananelach, the great book of Irish genealogy. It was written in the 1650s. It was uh, republished and edited in 2014 by Nulig O'Murila. It is 600 pages per volume and there are six volumes. Whoa. <laughs> so it's absolutely massive. But it's beautiful because the uh, Gaelic is on one page and the English translation is on <clears throat> the other page. So it's very, very useful and it contains a lot of information that isn't in the other ancient annals. And this is um, Wolf's surname dictionary. And this is his entry for the, uh, the, uh, the O'Farrells. And you can see, first of all, that there are a variety of different variants of the surname. So it could even be Frahill or Frawl, and it reads the name of several distinct families of which the best known are the O'Farrells of Annaly, and we're in Annaly at the moment in County Longford, of which they were for many centuries the ruling race. The head of the family resided at the town of Longford, which was formerly known as Longford e Farrell, or O'Farrell's Fortress. In later times, the O'Farrells divided into two great branches, uh, the heads of which were known respectively as O'Farrell Boy, or O'Farrell Bui, uh, the Yellow O'Farrells, and O'Farrell uh, Bane, or O'Farrell Bawn, the White O'Farrells, the Fair O'Farrells. Uh, the O'Farrells maintained their independence as a, a clan down to the year 1565, when Annaly was reduced to Shire ground by the Lord Deputy Sir Henry Sidney. Though uh, suffering severely from the plantation schemes of James I, the O'Farrells were able to take a prominent part in all the political and military movements of the 17th century, and many of them were afterwards distinguished officers in the Irish brigades uh, in the service of France. This family is now uh, very numerous. Other families of this name were seated in Wicklow and Tyrone they probably have a completely different genetic signature to the Farrells of Longford. So already, just by reading this, we're expecting at least three different <coughs> genetic signatures for the O'Farrells. Question is, have any of these Wicklow or Tyrone O'Farrells survived long enough to have living descendants who have done their DNA and are in the database, waiting for you to match them? That's the question. So I don't know if my O'Farrell ancestor was a Longford O'Farrell, a Wicklow O'Farrell, which is right beside Kildare, or a Tyrone O'Farrell. So you see now we're branching off into different genetic signatures. Let's just make a comment, Morris. Sure. <coughs> During the DNA, my own DNA, we came up with a family of Harrells. You can see where Harrell might come from. Mm -hmm. the, Irish, the Gaelic has this H. Uh, as a as a what would you say a pronunciation, so it's just interesting to see it there. Just know that oh, it's absolutely. A, the Harold name. Uh, we'll we'll be talking be. a lot about the Harolds later on, because they were quite shocked when they discovered they were Irish, <laughs> uh, because they thought it was an English uh, surname. Because Harold also translates as Harold, and of course Harold is very very English. 
And I think a, a, in, there is a Harrell DNA project, and there are about 10 different genetic groups in the Harrell DNA project, but one of those groups has a direct genetic connection to the Farrells of group two in the project. And we'll be talking a little bit about that later on. But that's not the only entry in Wolf's surname dictionary for the Farrells. There's also <coughs> O'Farrelly, uh, Farrella, uh, O'Fergus. Uh, so the, 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 fa the Farrelly uh, and f was uh, also known as Farley, descendant of Farchelach. And my, my Gaelic is, is not as good as it could be, but I'll try and uh, give a, as best a pronunciation as possible. They were co-orbs of St. Moog, Aranox uh, of Drumlane in County Cavan. And there was another family of the name in the neighbourhood of uh, Duntry League in the east of County Limerick. So now we have Farrelly's in Cavan and Limerick. That's five genetic signatures we're expecting so far. Then we have uh, Farrelly and Frawley, which is a variant of Farrell. Uh, we also have uh, Farris and Fergus, which are uh, a, a medical family in West Connacht and also uh, an ecclesial, ecclesiastical family in County Leitrim. So now we have seven origins for the name Farrell or its many variants. Also we have, just to, to, to tell you what a co-orb is, uh, a co-orb uh, and Aaronach were roles in the early medieval church. So an abbot was an ordained priest and he ran the monastery. So like we saw yesterday in Abbey Shrule, the, the monastery there would have had an abbot that ran the entire place. He would have had, um, he would have been a, 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 an ecclesiastical head normally elected by his colleagues who would have been bishops. And those bishops would also have been ordained priests. Um, they would have the same duties as today. They'd be responsible for looking after their Christian flock in the neighborhood of the monastery. Um, they were also the, the often an abbot of a monastery. But a co-arb and an Aaronach, these were married men. They were not ordained priests. Um, they were member. The co-arbs were members of the family which bred the saint. Hmm. So, if one of your children turned out to be a saint, you could be called co-arbs, and that would be inherited down through the ages. An Aaronach, on the other hand, was from a family who were chieftains of the clan territory on which the monastery stood. So that's interesting to have that kind of distinction between the clerical and the lay people that ran these monasteries. Uh, very importantly, the lands that, the, that formed part of the, the, of the uh, church property, it meant that rent was paid to the bishop and not to the, the local overlord. So that way, you, if the local overlord was a bit of a tyrant, you could avoid his power by saying, well, we have to pay our rent to the bishop. So it, it meant that there was quite a lot of politics going on uh, with Corbs and Aerodox from time to time. Uh, other variants of O'Farrell, uh, we have O'Farrell, uh, which could be O'Freel, Freel, Freel, and Freel. Um, and they were, this was the name of a family of Kin O'Connell, who were descendants of Owen, brother of St. Colm Kill. So now we're up to eight distinct genetic signatures. Um, they were in Tyrconnell in County Donegal. So is this where the Farrells of Donegal come from? That they were O'Farrell or Freel? I think we're probably veering away from that theory towards another theory entirely. Um, then we have the Harolds. So Harold, uh, Harold as well, um, it was due to the aspiration of the uh, F. If FH is, is written, then it becomes Arrol or Harrell rather than Farrell. And then we have uh, Harley, uh, Harley, and lastly we have a Frawley. So all of these could be variants of the same thing. And of course, over the course of time, people's surnames changed because people were illiterate for most of the last 1,000 years. And it's only in the last 100, 200 years that literacy levels have really increased. But for the average person, they would not know how to spell their name. Um, also, surname spelling was not standardized till very, very late. Shakespeare spelt his name 26 different ways during his own lifetime. So if it's good enough for Shakespeare, it's good enough. 
So those are just an, an example of some ferals. Here are some more, some other ones as well that may be uh, mutated into ferals. The fairies. Um, uh, there's also ferry from East Ulster, and there's uh, fori, uh, which is a Mayo name. So again, we're getting more genetic uh, signatures because. Uh, people will misspell names, or a fairy will become a feral, or a pharos will become a feral. So there's a variety of reasons for why there may be different genetic signatures associated with the feral surname. So, multiple surname variants, multiple possible origins. We have Longford, Wicklow, Tyrone associated with feral, farley and frawley. We have Cavan and Limerick associated with farley and farley. We have West Connacht, Leitrim, associated with Ferris, Ferris, and Fergus. And we have Donegal, associated with Freel, Freel, and Ferro. Now this is where possibly these names originated, or possibly where they migrated to from another place. So this is not necessarily the origin of these various variants. They may have come there from somewhere else and became numerous. So we're expecting multiple DNA signatures. So let's look at uh, DNA and uh, how it is used for genealogy. Uh, te taking a test is very simple. You either swab your cheek or you give a, a sample of saliva into a test tube. That goes off to the lab uh, in, a, in an envelope. Um, you post it off. And uh, in the lab, they examine your uh, sample. They run it through their machine and then they publish your results on your own web page, protected by your own username and password. <coughs> Not only that, but they compare your results with all the other people in their database. And there are currently 18 million people in the various companies' databases. The biggest company is Ancestry with 10 million, followed by 23andMe with 5 million, followed by MyHeritage with 2 million, then Family Tree DNA with one and a half million, and then GEDmatch, which is a public database where you can compare across platforms, they have just hit one million. So there's a variety of different websites that you can upload your DNA data to. If you are really enthusiastic about genealogy and you're a member of Ancestry, how many people have a, a subscription with Ancestry? Great, about five or six people. I would say do the Ancestry test because you can uh, have access to their 10 million strong database. But not only that, you can download a copy of your results to your computer and then upload it for free to MyHeritage, Family Tree DNA, and GEDmatch, allowing you to swim in four gene pools for the price of one. So it's the most cost-effective way for those people that are very, very into genealogy. For everybody else, if you just want to test, you know, put your toe in the water, Family Tree DNA do the cheapest test. My Heritage sometimes do as well. They're frequently having sales, and you can get it for as low as um, I've seen it come down to 49 US dollars. So you can get it fairly cheaply. So the other thing that Family Tree DNA allows you to do is it allows you to start your own projects, and that's how the Farrell DNA project started. Um, I didn't start the project. The project was already running, and I thought. Um, uh, this is what myself and Sam were discussing. Uh, this is going back four years ago now. And I said, uh, let me have a look. Oh, there is a Farrell project. Oh, it doesn't look very active. Let me email the administrator. So I emailed the administrator and said, oh, would you like any help with the project? I'm quite happy to volunteer to be co-administrator. And he wrote back saying, I, uh, I'm not able to do it anymore. I've got other things going on. Would you be so kind as to take it over? So uh, suddenly I inherited 170 members in the Farrell DNA project. So that's how I got into it. All of this is done voluntarily, by the way. Um, there's about 9,000 surname projects hosted on Family Tree DNA, but it's all run by volunteers. So we, uh, nobody gets paid for it. Um, and it's just for the love of the actual science and the hobby. But let's take a closer look at your DNA, the, the little cheek cells that you scraped off when you were scraping your cheek. Uh, here is one of those cheek cells here, and inside you see these little blue things here. They're called mitochondria. They're like the batteries of the cell. They're the, the, what give it the energy. And that is only passed on. It's passed on by, by the mother to all of her children 
but is only passed on by the daughters to their children and their daughters to their children. So this goes back along the mother, 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 mother line. And it's very, very useful if you want to see uh, how your maternal line, your direct maternal line, uh, the passage that came out of Africa uh, 250,000 years ago. In the nucleus of the cell, we have the chromosomes. And we have 46 chromosomes <coughs> in humans. If you were a potato, you'd have 48. If you were a chimpanzee, you'd have 56. If you were a banana, you'd have eight. And if you were a fruit fly, you wouldn't know you had chromosomes. So <laughs> it varies from species to species. Um, but we have 46 in humans, and they're divided into 23 pairs. So you've got two copies of chromosome one. One of them came from your father, the other one came from your mother. And they reunited when the egg and the sperm fused, and you've got your two copies back. And the same with chromosome two, there's two copies of chromosome two. One is paternal, one is maternal, and so on. You get down to chromosome pair number 23, these are also known as the sex chromosomes because they determine your sex, whether you're male or female. And there's two types of sex chromosome. There's the X chromosome and the Y chromosome. If you have two X chromosomes, that translates as a woman. If you have an X and a Y chromosome, <laughs> then that translates as a man. So we have Danny DeVito up here. Um, and uh, you can see that the Y chromosome is only about a third of the size uh, as the X chromosome. So I always like making the point that your average woman is more of a person genetically than your average man. <laughs> Girl power. So out of this uh, biology, we get three main types of tests. The Y DNA and the Y chromosome is only passed from father to son, father to son, father to son. So it's very useful for tracking back along the father, 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 father line. What else comes down that line? Not just the Y chromosome, the surname. So in Western societies where we have inherited surnames, it's very, very useful for doing surname research. Now, of course, there's some societies and cultures where the surname changes every generation on the father, father, father side. An example is Iceland, where you will have Peter Johnson, John Williamson, William Erickson, Eric Peterson, and it goes back like that. The name changes every single generation. That's the patronymic naming convention. Um, and obviously, it's not going to be very useful for researching surnames on that line because the surnames change every single generation. On the other side of the family tree, we have the mitochondrial DNA, which is very useful for going back along the mother, mother, mother line. It's the least useful of the three tests genealogically, so I do not recommend it for anybody unless you've got a very specific question. Uh, for example, is this Sarah Kelly, who was born in 1800, the sister of this, Sarah, uh, this Mary Kelly, who was born in 1802? If they both have the same mitochondrial DNA, then you can make a fairly good assumption that they were sisters. But that's the only very specific case that I recommend mitochondrial DNA for. Autosomal DNA covers all of your ancestral lines, all your maternal ancestral lines, all your paternal ancestral lines. This is the most useful test from a general genealogical point of view. If you're interested in surnames, like we are with the Farrells, then the Y DNA test is the one for you. Um, I have uh, family tree DNA kits here. If anybody is interested in doing a Y DNA test later on, then that will cost $129. It's normally $169, but I get a discount from uh, family tree DNA uh, to sell the test at these events. I don't take any money. You fill out the white form, you post it off, and they will uh, uh, either contact you or you can put your credit card details in the form post it off yourself, and they just take care of all the payment details. So if you want to, we can do a DNA test here today, and then you can post it off, and um, uh, you'll get the results in six to 10 weeks' time. So why DNA and mitochondrial DNA are useful for deep as well as recent ancestry, but the autosomal DNA has a much more limited reach. It only goes back to about 1700 or so, uh, 1750, it connects you with genetic cousins with whom you share a common ancestor within the last 200 to 250 years. 
And the reason for that, of course, is that the autosomal DNA, it gets diluted every single generation. You know, you only get half from your father, a quarter from your grandfather, an eighth from your great-grandfather, a sixteenth, a thirty-second, and so on. So by the time you get back uh, seven generations, the amount of DNA that's been passed on is so small, it's difficult to make those connections. But it's very useful for confirming second cousin relationships, third cousin relationships, and fourth cousin relationships as well. And that's very useful for Irish research because that's exactly where we have our brick walls, around about the 1800, 1830 time point for most ancestral lines. So we're gonna focus on Y-DNA uh, for the Far Farrell project. And this is just to emphasize that uh, it shows you a Y chromosome. And uh, here you can see it unraveling. There's the double helix. Uh, and then we have all these letters, the genetic code. And it's made up of these four letters, A, C, T, G. And uh, there are two types of DNA marker arising out of that. You have the STR marker. And we've been talking about STRs today. It stands for short tandem repeat. Here you can see TAC, TAC, TAC. It's repeated three times and the motif is TAC. Um, on the other hand, a SNP uh, marker, SNP, SNP, is a substitution. This might have been a G in the father, but it's now an A in the son. So it's just a single letter is switched. And those are the two main types of DNA marker. You get them not just in the Y DNA, you get them on all the DNA. Uh, so we'll be talking about STRs and SNPs. STRs are a string of letters and because this is repeated three times, it has the value of three. So you'll see STR marker values written as numbers, whereas SNPs you will see as uh, letters, and they'll be named. Uh, there are, the STR marker test can either come as a 37 marker test, a 67 marker test, a 111 marker test. There you can see the usual prices. I always say start off, start low, go slow. So start off with the basic one, which is 37. That's normally 169. There are 129 with the discount that I have. And then the SNP markers, you can either buy a single SNP test or a SNP pack, or you can go for the big Y. And we'll be showing you some people have done a big Y, some people have done a SNP pack, and some people have done a single SNP. A single SNP test, like it says, is just you're testing one DNA marker. A SNP pack, you're testing about 120 of them. And the big Y, you're testing about 85,000 DNA markers on your Y chromosome, mm. which explains why it's normally $650 to do. So it's not cheap. And it's not something you may necessarily need to do if people that you match genetically have already done the test. They can serve as your proxy. So we try and keep the costs down as much as possible. But a lot of people are very interested and have the money, so they will spend the $650. So this is what your results look like when you get your STO results. It's literally just a string of numbers. And it doesn't tell you anything in and of itself. It gives you some idea maybe what haplogroup you belong to. A haplogroup is just a, a, a group of people with broadly similar genetic signature. And it probably means you share a common ancestor 20,000 years ago. So for example, in Western Europe, the common haplogroups would be R1B, which is kind of Anglo-Saxon, if you like. Uh, there's also uh, haplogroup I, which tends to be Scandinavian. It's a little bit broader than that. Whereas in China, it's haplogroup O. And in South America, it's haplogroup Q. So as human beings moved out of Africa and their DNA was mutating every couple of generations, the genetic signature changed subtly. But over thousands of years, this group in Western Europe had a very different genetic signature to this group in China. So if I get your Y DNA and I look at it and uh, it tells me what haplogroup you belong to, I'll be able to say roughly what part of the world your ancestors originated in. Was it China? Was it South America? Was it Western Europe? So the SDRs are just a string of numbers, whereas the, the uh, SNP signature is uh, uh, letters. And they usually have names like M222, is the name they give to the marker that is uh, common in people who are related to Nile of the nine hostages. L226 is the marker for Brian Baru. So uh, that just gives you an idea of the differences between STR and SNP. Um, the real value of your DNA is when you compare it to other people. So they're going to be comparing your DNA to about 610 
a thousand Y DNA records in the Family Tree DNA database. These are uh, the results of a Farrell. Here you can see that he matches, uh, this is at the 37 mark and level, there's 42 matches. These are just the first few of them. Here's a Farrell, he matches a Farrell. Here's a Mohan, Brogan, Roberts, Jackson, Robin, Archer, Gregor, Reynolds, Henry. So there's a lot of non farrell names among his matches. So why are they there? Why are these different names in your list of matches? And there's three reasons. Either it's a chance match, and your uh, genetic signature happens to have evolved in the same way as a, somebody else's genetic signature, so that the values approximate each other, and the, uh, the, the computer declares it as a match. Now, you are related, but you're probably related much further back than this would suggest. That just by chance, your genetic signatures have mutated into a similar uh, direction. The second possibility is that there has been some sort of surname or DNA switch along the way, and we'll be talking about that. Adoption is, a, is an obvious one, where the, the Y DNA of the adoptee comes from the birth uh, father, but the surname the adoptee gets would be from the adoptive parents. And the last one is it could be a name that happened before, you, the connection could be before surnames were introduced. That probably happens very rarely. Um, most often it's a chance match or there's been some sort of surname or DNA switch along the line. Um, now, as an administrator of the Farrell DNA project, what I will do is I will group people together based on their genetic distance. And the genetic distance is this column here, and you can see it's uh, 2, 3, 3, 3, 3. These are the number of steps away from an exact match. So if the genetic distance was zero, it would mean that there's no step, there's no distance between you and the other person. You are an exact match to that other person. You have a genetic distance of zero. A uh, genetic distance of three means that those numbers, there are three steps in those not that string of numbers different to the match that you have in your list of matches. And what we will generally do is we will group people who are less than four steps away from an exact match at the 37 marker level, less than six at 67, less than 10 at 111. We'll also be relying on analysis of SNP markers, and we'll also be relying on uh, analysis of other markers of potential relatedness to group people together. And the grouping is very important because if you have not grouped people correctly, then you will be saying these people are related when in fact they're not. So the grouping is a very, very important part of this entire process and takes up a lot of my time. Uh, there's the genetic distance and that's where you find the terminal SNP. You'll also find it in the haplogroup column, uh, column as well. Here it's M269. That's where you find your terminal SNP. <coughs> so those are the two main pieces of the evidence that we use for grouping people. This is the Gleason DNA project that I also run. Um, and this is what uh, it looks like when you have all of your people grouped. So this is lineage one of the Gleasons. Here are all the members, if you like, stacked on top of each other. Here are their Y chromosomes stacked on top of each other. Here are all the markers here. They're all aligned. And the values, the numbers for each of these markers are across the top. And what these, uh, these uh, colored columns in this illustrate is people where the number has changed and it shows that there's a mutation that's shared uh, uh, down that entire group of people. And the important part for this slide is the pretty colors. Because the pretty colors actually show you the genetic signature of group one, group two, because you can see that the genetic signature, the color pattern down here is very different mm -hmm. to the colored pattern up here. And it's very different to the colored pattern in this third group. You see this block in the middle? Very different from the other two. And all this is saying to us is that we are uh, accurately grouping people together with similar genetic signatures. What's the point of that? I can now say that if you match people in lineage two, group two, they come from North Tipperary with 99% confidence. If you match people in lineage three, I can say with 99% confidence, your ancestors came from West Clare. And if you match people in lineage one, 
Your ancestors go back to a named individual, Thomas Gleeson, who was born in Cockfield in Suffolk in England in 1609. <coughs> this is a group of English Gleesons who migrated early on to America and there was then they were very successful. They had lots of sons who had lots of sons who had lots of sons. Population explosion. A lot of the Gleesons uh, in North America will actually go back to this one named individual. And we still haven't been able to find any of his ancestors in England. Everybody in who, America who matches him, we can say, your ancestry goes back to this guy here. So they may be stuck at 1800, but we can say, this is the direction you need to look. There are a couple of generations between your 1800 brick wall and your probable ancestor, Thomas Gleeson, and this is the direction you need to research in. So it helps people focus their genealogical research. Now, it helps group people together, it helps identify a person's origin, and it helps identify a person's ancestor in some uh, specific cases. Now, in the uh, Farrell DNA project, we have 15 distinct genetic groups. We have this uh, genetic group one here. The largest is genetic group two. And then we have three, four, five, six, seven, eight, nine, ten, eleven, and then the last few groups are only about two or three people per group. But we'll be looking at these groups in turn and seeing what does the DNA tell us about where these different groups came from. So the Farrell DNA project was started in 2004. Uh, this is the recruitment. Um, this is where I took over here, and we're up to about 400 people now, and we are recruiting at the rate of about seven new members per month. So it really is growing now, and we're up to about 416 people altogether. Uh, we have the uh, Family Tree DNA website, so you can go on there and you can read about it. This is public, so you can uh, read all about the project there. We also have a, a blog associated with the project, and that's where I uh, publish uh, updates on various analyses that are uh, ongoing, and also new members. And of course we have the Farrell Clan uh, Facebook group run by John and his team, uh, which is a very, very useful way of reaching the wider Farrell diaspora. So there are 15 distinct genetic groups within the project, and uh, what we're going to do first of all is run through them, and I'll show you where each of them comes from. <coughs> Uh, but first of all, you can even see that in some of the groups there is uh, unusual surnames that are not Farrell. Here's um, Burke, here is Deerduff, here is Walsh, and um, there are other ones as well. So, again, why these different surnames within these different groups? Because it's a chance match, or there's been some sort of surname or DNA switch. Highly unlikely it's a pre-surname relative. Usually, it's either a chance match or it's adoption, or it's a surname or DNA switch, and we'll talk about that. Question here. Um, how did you, like, do, do you have the DNA from the one man in 16 something? Like, how do you know, so how did you get that comparison to say where you belong now? Oh, right, okay. Um, because uh, the records in America are superb in New England. And we actually have a paper trail for Gleason Lineage 1. We have a paper trail all the way back to 1609. And they've made the connection across the pond to England, where they actually have church records uh, in England that go back one further generation than the uh, common ancestor of all the American Gleasons who are around the New England area. So, um, yes, and that's really, really important because those pedigrees that extend all the way back uh, are useful for everybody else. So everybody in group one can piggyback onto the longest pedigree of the person that they match within the group. So but that's a great question. Um, <clears throat> we also have a, quite a few people that are ungrouped in the Farrell DNA project. Um, there must be about 30 or 40 of them. And the reason why uh, some people don't have any match within the project is because perhaps their Farrell ancestor was not on their direct male line. 
So we do get a lot of people joining who have feral ancestry, but not on their father, father, father line. And that's why you do see uh, different names in that on group section. Also, there are going to be some ferals that are probably from a relatively rare group. And maybe they're the first person from that group to have done the test. So they're not going to match anybody else in the project. So those ferals are waiting for somebody else to come along to actually match them. Question here. That's pretty much the situation I'm in when I got my FT DNA test. I immediately got a bunch of emails from Egypt that I batched a bunch of people in Egypt and I actually had them redo the test. Right. Because it was so weird. And we don't match anybody that I can find. And what was your haplogroup? I uh, think it starts with J1. J1, right, okay. Yeah. And again, that's very Middle Eastern. Yes. You know, so. Um, uh, and that will happen from time to time, is that we will find that our particular feral line, it goes back feral, 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 but it's associated with a rather strange genetic signature. And there are other people in the project that actually um, are in the same situation. And I'm going to be talking to you specifically about group number nine, I think it is, who made some very interesting discoveries in that respect recently. In what? Uh, they have a very unique genetic signature. I see. And um, they've done a little bit of detective work and they've actually found where that genetic signature came from. Wow. So, um, uh, and they wouldn't have been able to do that without the DNA, of course. But we'll be looking at each of these groups in turn. Um, uh, we did talk about these surname or DNA switches, and this is what happens a lot of the time. And there are a variety of reasons for why it happens, especially with Irish surnames. And one of them is allegiance, swearing allegiance to the Lord of the Tua, swearing allegiance to the clan chief. Uh, for example, if you wanted to come under the protection of a chief, you might be uh, at Leeson, for example, but you change your name to Farrell to show allegiance to the Farrells, and then therefore you get protection from the Farrells. So then your sons are Farrells. And their sons are Farrells, but they're carrying Gleason Y DNA. So that's how um, the Farrell surname can be, become associated with different um, uh, surnames. And this was commonly the situation with servants and vassals and slaves and tenants um, and soldiers that they would actually take on the name of the local chief that they were um, either fighting for or serving under. Now, of course, uh, John mentioned uh, adoption, fostering, and guardianship. Um, adoption has been uh, around for as long as, as man himself. So there will be adoptions all, all the time. Um, how many people have adoptions in their family tree? I have two. So a few people have adoptions in their family tree. You know, it's, it's commonplace. It's commonplace. And doing the DNA test, you will be contacted by adoptees who are trying to find their birth families. Um, I worked a lot with adoptees. Um, the Irish adoption agencies now refer clients to me so I can actually help uh, their clients when the paper trail is, is missing. Uh, we've had a recent scandal in Ireland where apparently a lot of uh, adoptions were illegal. Um, they weren't registered properly. And instead of the names of the natural parents being put on the birth certificate, the legal birth certificate, the adoptive parents' names were put on the legal birth certificate, meaning that there is no documentary evidence to help these people find out who their natural parents were. And in that situation, DNA is the only way forward. Um, a very, very common cause that we probably underestimate, if you're a young widow and you've got three children and they're six months, 12, 12, uh, six months 18 months, and two years old, you're going to marry again and you're, ch you're going to take the second husband's name, your children are going to take the second husband's name as well. So if the second husband is, is uh, 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 a Gleason, and the first husband was an O'Farrell, those children are going to be Gleason by name, O'Farrell by DNA. And that's another reason for why there's a, this surname or DNA switch. It can be a legal condition of marriage. You are not marrying my daughter unless you change your name to O'Farrell, because I want the O'Farrell name to, to oh. perpetuate. Uh, you will not inherit a penny unless you change your name to a feral. Because I want that feral name to perpetuate, because I only have daughters. Taking the wife's name upon marriage. Oliver Cromwell wasn't Oliver Cromwell. 
He was Oliver Williams. His, his um, several generations previously, one of the Williams men married Catherine Cromwell, who was the sister of Thomas Cromwell, something like that, who was the right-hand man of Henry VIII. Very, very important uh, association. And so that's how the Cromwell name came down the Williams line. There, he was Oliver Cromwell by name. He was Oliver Williams by DNA. Customary coupling with powerful people. Uh, in <coughs> some Celtic societies, it was customary to offer your wife to the guest for the, to the, uh, to the, guest for the night, uh, so that the guest would feel that they were safe in your house. Now, that's a bit unusual. It might, this might be the reason why we don't bring Brehan Law back in. Um, associated with that was this naming uh, uh, custom, where on her deathbed, the wife would call the husband in and say, uh, oh dear, uh, I, I need to have a word with you. Um, and he would say, oh, what can I do for you, my, my darling wife? And she'd say, well, you know our eldest. And the husband would say, well, of course I do. Sure isn't he my son? She said, ah, well, that's what I want to talk to you about. <laughs> Very strange custom. Um, infidelity. Now, in infidelity and illegitimacy, they meant totally different things under Breton law than they do today. In fact, there are some stories where uh, the, the wife, the, 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 the woman could actually choose who she wanted to sire her child, mm. and who she wanted to raise her child. Mm. So there was a huge amount of uh, girl power under Brehan law compared to, say, English common law that came in in the 1600s. So women in Ireland under Brehan law had far more social status than they did under uh, English common law. Uh, because this concept of infidelity and illegitimacy was very, very different to what we have today. And of course, another big cause for this surname or DNA switch is anglicization of the name. So we saw that the Gaelic was O'Farrell, and that became Farrell. Um, uh, the same with um, uh, Gleeson. Uh, Gleeson was Glosheen, which translates as little green man. So I come from a long line of little green men. Now, I leave it to you to decide whether they were leprechauns or Martians. <laughs> But the name Green, for example, could be Huni or could be Fahi. So Fahi could change to Green, Huni could change to Green because they were Irish, um, I, they were based on Irish words for the colour green. And there's lots of other causes as well. The chances that your Y DNA, your father, father, father line, goes back in an unbroken line to the person who originated your name and passed down the Y DNA initially. It's 50-50. So that means that on every single line of our family tree, at some point in time, there's a 50-50 chance that there's going to be that surname or DNA switch. And you'll, at one particular point, you're going to have not two, two uh, parents, three parents. There'll be the biological father, the father whose name was given to the child, and then you'll have the mother. And in some of your ancestral lines, you'll end up with four parents. If it's an adoption, for example, um, uh, a couple who can't have a child, one of the locals gives them a child to raise. Completely different mother, completely different father. You now have two biological parents and two adoptive parents on that particular line. And then you've got four lines going back from that point in time. And that happens in all of our family trees. We have a genealogical family tree and we have a genetic family tree. Um, and this is how the Farrell name evolved over time. Assuming that there's going to be surname and DNA switches along the way, um, DNA switches might have happened like this. So this person here, there's a DNA switch, and then suddenly you get this red DNA passed down to all of the descendants. Uh, that person over there has a, has a blue one. Then we have a, a yellow one over here. Uh, there is a green one that just emerged here. So there were two DNA switches on this particular line. Not just one, but two. And then there's another one there, there's another one there. The other thing is that you might get surname switches. So, for example, the Farrells move into an area where there's uh, a lot of English Farleys. And maybe they change from Farrell to Farley at that point in time. Their Farleys, they're now Far Farleys by name, 
but they're still ferals by DNA. And the same might have happened with the ferrous. Uh, some ferals might have changed the name to ferrous, and they became ferrous by name, but feral by DNA. The other important thing is that not everybody survived to the present day. Some lines of descent died out. They didn't have any children. Some lines of descent daughtered out. They only had girls, so there was no Y DNA to pass on. Uh, so the point here is that when we test ourselves today, when we test all the ferals today, in the present day, we're getting a very limited snapshot of the descent of Y DNA from the first feral a thousand years ago. But I always quote Shakespeare in this regard and what he said about the ferals in Romeo and Juliet, Act 2, Scene 2. A feral by any other name would smell as sweet. <laughs> if you don't believe me, turn to the person beside... No, no, don't. Do <laughs> so we all have these surname or DNA switches in our families, in our genealogies, and we can expect multiple genetic groups of ferals as a result of that. So let's look at, take a very, very quick whirlwind tour through these uh, 15 genetic signatures. The first group is Farley from Virginia. The second group is Farrell from Longford. The third group, Farrell, Virginia. Farris, Scotland. Farley, England. Frawley, Ireland. Farrell, England. Farrell, Ireland. Farrell, US. Farrell, Ireland. O'Farrell, Ireland, Farrer, England, Farrell, Ireland, Farrow, England, and O'Farrell, Ireland. So that gives you an idea of the main surname variants in these 15 groups and where they came from based on the genealogical data they have provided in their profile on family tree DNA. And I think what's noticeable is First of all, the huge range of feral variants that we're seeing. Also, a lot of them are still stuck in the US. They haven't been able to make that leap back across the pond either to uh, Britain or to Ireland. And we are seeing uh, names like Farrer and Farrow as well that may or may not be related to the Farrells. So these are the 15 groups that are currently within the project. This is going to get bigger as time goes on and we'll have more genetic groups and uh, as more people in the on-group section get a match and then they moved up into the group section. So, analyzing each of these genetic groups, what is the dominant surname? These are the questions you could ask. What's the dominant surname? Have members been accurately grouped? Are there any chance matches, any surnames or DNA switches that are obvious? Where is the group from? What's the structure of the group? What's the branching structure? How old is the group? Where does the group sit on the tree of mankind? Who are the nearest neighbors, genetically, of this group? And is this consistent with what we know from the ancient Irish annals? So these are the kind of questions you can interrogate each of these groups. And uh, for, you might get chance matches as a result of something called convergence, where the genetic signatures have evolved separately and then evolved back towards each other so that they look the same, but in actual fact, uh, the, the common ancestor is much further back than you might anticipate. When you come across a surname or DNA switch, you have to ask yourself a question, well, which came first, the chicken or the egg? Was it the Gleason chicken or the O'Farrell egg? Uh, and it can be difficult to, to try to decipher which of those uh, came first. Was it Gleason, 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 O'Farrell, 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 or was it the other way around? Um, in order to answer the question, where is the group from, I rely very heavily on the information provided by the project members, specifically the most distant known ancestor birth location. If we know the birth location of the most distant known feral ancestor on your direct mail line, that gives us a clue where that particular genetic group came from. And that's very, very important for our uh, diaspora Irish ferals because a lot of them will be stuck in America or stuck in Australia or stru stuck in New Zealand. And unless we actually have um, the birth location of the most distant known ancestor, it can be very difficult to, to try to decipher where this particular genetic group came from. Um, what is the group structure? We use something called the 
SAP program, and I'll show you that. We also rely very, very heavily on, uh, again, the pedigrees that people provide. And some of them have got pedigrees that go back into the 1600s. And we're very, very lucky uh, in Farrell Group 2 to actually have a member who has a pedigree, an Irish pedigree, that goes back into the 1600s. Um, so that is very, very important, supplying your pedigree. Uh, to decide how old the group is, we can again look at these pedigrees. There's something called the TIP tool on Family Tree DNA that gives us an estimate based on the STR values. Uh, we can also date using the SNP markers, and we can also use the, the mutation history tree generated by the SAP program to give us estimates of, of dates. And then in terms of where does the uh, group sit on the tree of mankind, we'll make a lot of use of uh, something called the Big Tree, which is a, a free service uh, that offers additional analyses for your SNP marker testing. And we'll also be working very closely with haplogroup projects. And haplogroup projects are much larger than surname projects. There are usually several thousand people and they give us a much better overview of the data than you would do from the narrow perspective of just looking at a surname. And it was because of our connection with um, a haplogroup project that we actually were notified that the Harolds matched the Farrells. Um, and that led on to some really interesting discoveries. So Farrell Group 1, are they Irish or are they English? The dominant surname variant is Farley, and you can see it there. Farley, 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 Farley. There's an Ambrose, there's a Jarrett, an Eves, and a Farley. So Farley is the most frequent uh, variant. Um, is the grouping accurate? Well, these are the values for each of these people. These are the DNA marker values, the STR values. You can see it's a string of numbers. The colored boxes indicate mutations. And you can see that there are very, very few of those mutations among this group of people. And that says to me that they probably are accurately grouped together. I also note that these two people here have a mutation of 11. So they could be on a separate sub-branch of this group. And these two here have the same mutation of 30 when everybody else is 29. So they could form another sub-branch of this particular group. So we might be able to see uh, that this group is splitting into a certain structure. Now, um, are there any uh, chance matches, any surname or DNA switches? Possibly yes, because we've got different surnames. We have an Ambrose, a, a Jarrett, and an Eves. The Ambrose goes back to Farler Ambrose. So Farler comes in there. There's probably a switch around about that 1777 time point. And then uh, Jarrett hasn't provided any information, so we don't know whether it's a chance match or it's a surname or DNA switch. But Eves goes back to Archibald Foster Eves, 1798. Um, that could be a chance match or it could be a surname or DNA switch. We're not able to tell just from that information that has been provided. Um, where is it from? If you look what they've written, they've got Virginia, Georgia, Virginia, Virginia, nothing, nothing, Tennessee, uh, nothing, nothing, nothing. So uh, the majority of people seem to have come from Virginia. And that's why it's important that members provide this information so we can get some idea. So our working hypothesis for this group is that it's largely an American group that probably originated in Virginia. But of course, where did they come from before Virginia? Because Farley is not a name for Native American Indians. <laughs> so it has to come from England, Ireland, Scotland, Wales, probably one of those English-speaking countries. Other questions we can ask about uh, this particular group. Well, Farley, is Farley Irish or is it English? Well, we saw from um, Wolf's surname dictionary that Farley is one of the variants of Farley, and they talked about it coming from County Cavan uh, or also from East Limerick. But it also is possibly an English uh, surname. The ancient surname is of Anglo-Saxon origin uh, and is habitational uh, from any of the various places in England called Farley. And there's Farleys in Berkshire, Derbyshire, Hampshire, and Staffordshire. So this could be an English Farley, or it could be an Irish Farley. Uh, what we're seeing here is that one of these people has put down England as the country of origin, 
The rest of them have said uh, unknown mm -hmm. origin, uh, United Kingdom, this person's put down Scotland, um, but most of them don't actually know where their Farley name came from. But possibly it came from England. Uh, we didn't do the SAP on this particular group because there's so few people in it. How old is the group? Well, the oldest um, uh, goes back to 1560. The oldest pedigree goes back to 1560. Uh, based on the tip tool on um, family tree DNA, it gives us an estimate of 1770. But these estimates are hugely, hugely inaccurate um, because they have such a wide range. So that will be 1770 plus or minus 300 years. <laughs> <laughs> Statistically accurate, genealogically inexact. Um, and that is always going to be a problem with these estimates, that you do have a wide range random. We could also have got an estimate from the SAP program, but I didn't do it because it's a small group. They have done SNP testing, and you can see here that they have identified the SNP BY71827 as the most downstream SNP for this particular group. And their nearest neighbors are people called Ferrari, Burgess, uh, Barber, Saunders, and Taylor. And if we look at that on the big tree, we can see them over here. Saunders, Ferrari, Burgess, and Farley. And this gives you an idea of who their neighbors are. There's Neelys here, there's Ackerman. You see these people are English, this one is German, this one is English. It's still undergoing analysis. And this is on the, uh, the family tree DNA's version of the tree of mankind, exactly the same <coughs> kind of thing, but it shows you where these various people sit. Ferrari sits one branch above, Barber is two branches above, Burgess is three branches above, and Saunders and Taylor are four branches above. So this gives you an idea of where the nearest genetic neighbors uh, sit <coughs> on the tree of mankind. The question is, does this tell us anything about where they came from? Here you can look at surname distribution maps, and we can also age them. This, this is how old these are. So. Um, JFS0027, this one here. This one up here is around about 1,500 years old. So you see that we're not even in the surname era with these SNP markers. We haven't come down the tree of mankind to the present surname era, the last 1,000 years. Um, there's also another Farley match who hasn't joined the Farrell DNA project and he hasn't uploaded his results to the big tree. Uh, so we don't have that additional analysis. And that's a problem as well, is that a lot of people who do the test don't know you also have to follow on by doing uh, a lot of other things, like uploading it to the DNA project, uploading it to the big tree. And if, they, if everybody did this, and if the companies made it easier for us to do this, then it would actually give us a huge amount more information and would really give us value from the test. This is the Farley surname uh, in a surname distribution map. Here you can see the distribution in Ireland and in Britain. You see it's quite uh, widespread in England. Uh, there's a lot of Farleys in Cork. Maybe there were merchants from the UK. There's quite a few Farleys in Northeast Ireland as well. Nothing around the Longford area to speak of. A little bit of Farley, but not a huge amount. If we look at those nearest genetic neighbors, Here's the, the Farler surname, and again, it's mainly English. Here's the Saunders surname, fairly ubiquitous. Here's the Ferrari surname. Does anybody drive a Ferrari? Yeah. You're, you're related to the Farrells of this particular group. And then uh, here's the Burgess surname. Uh, and again, it's fairly widespread in Ireland and in England. Um, all the associated surnames, relatively widespread. Uh, it's very difficult to say with any degree of certainty that it, these point to a particular origin, a geographical location for the origin of this particular group. So we can say in summary about group one, the dominance, the variant is, is Farley, they're from Virginia, where they were before that, possibly England, we really don't know at this point in time. What this group needs is we need more members in this group. So we need more people to join and to match this particular group. We need more information on uh, the most distant known ancestor, and specifically the location, because that could give us a real big clue to the origins of this particular uh, genetic group. We need people to supply their pedigrees, and also we need more people to do this uh, SNP testing 
uh, particularly a, a, a second big Y test. One person has done the big Y, you see BY, the other have done a single SNP and a single SNP. Um, and these are the green ones here. Uh, but we need a second person to do the big Y test to bring us further down the tree of mankind into the surname era. That would be the aim for all of these genetic groups. So that's group one. Now group two, I'm going to spend a little bit of time on because this is going to be of interest to the majority of people here in this room. Not only because group two is the largest group within the project, but it probably goes back to Longford and it probably represents the Longfords of Annaly from the ancient Irish annals. There's, so there's 46 people in this group altogether, and the most common variant in this group is Farrell. There are 27 Farrells in this group. There are six Ferrells. Uh, there's two Farleys, one Oferall, one Harrell, and there's about nine people who are either chance matches or surname and or DNA switches. And the chance matches are these two Yorks here, there's two, two people called York, Y-O-R-K-E. Uh, there's one person called Nolan, or Nolan. And these are definitely chance matches because they have done uh, SNP testing and that shows that they are on an adjacent branch to these Farrells, but their SDR signature looks similar to the Farrells that uh, it has grouped them uh, in this Farrell group. Um, there's also surname or DNA switches, uh, Ruth, uh, Ramey, Riley, Kelly, and Chichester. Those are all documented, or probably documented, surname or DNA switches. And you can see that by looking at the most distant known ancestor information. Ruth has put down a Farrell as their most distant known ancestor. Uh, the Ramey case is, is uh, very, very interesting, very, very well documented. They've been able to go back in time to find where that switch occurred and they have documentation to say that there was an adoption in the family back in the 1700s. So that Ramey is a Ramey by name and a Harrell by DNA. Um, where are they from? Well, we have Limerick, Galway, Ireland, um, Cavan, Tipperary, <coughs> and then we have Ballybeg, Carrick Edmund, Longford. That's the first page of members. Second page of members, we have Tipperary, Cork, Longford, Cullew in Longford. We have Bally McCormack in Longford, Longford and Longford. So there's six people in the 46 that have put Longford as their birth location of their most distant known ancestor. That's a very strong indication that this group actually came from Longford initially. How old is the group? Well, the oldest pedigree on the first page of members is 1718, but on the second page we have a pedigree that goes back to 1640. So this is documented pedigree that goes back to 1640. Um, if you'd use the tip tool, we're getting an estimate for this group of 1440. So this group, based on the DNA and the mutations we see in the DNA, they go back to about 1440 plus or minus 100 years, 200 years. But we get the same result with the SNPs. If we use the SNP markers for dating when the group arose, we're getting around about 1400. And the SAP tree, because we did use the SAP program to generate a mutation history tree for this group, it's giving us an estimate of about 1450. So it looks like with this particular group, genetically, we're going back to a common ancestor who lived sometime in the 1400s. And that's pretty good. Of course, what we don't know is what happened for the 400 years before that, that the Farrell surname was around. And that's always going to be a, a problem, is what happened before that time when you have uh, isolated when the most distant known ancestor probably arose, or when the most recent common ancestor for everybody in the group arose. Bill, question? I can identify my entry on that. All right. Others identify their entry on that. Uh, yes, I'm there. Yeah. You're there? I'm okay. There. You, you're there. You can see it here. Yeah. Um, 
Yes, I have um, hidden the um, yeah. kit numbers. I'm, I'm, I'm the very bottom one. This one yeah. here? Yes, four and eight and thirty-one. That's All right. Yeah. Okay. I'm sure. Very good. Very good. <laughs> Um, no, for privacy yeah. concerns, yeah, and for data protection, you have to, to, you know, especially in a public uh, place, you have to take um, uh, the necessary precautions to preserve people's privacy and, and protect the data. Uh, so nobody can be identified, but hopefully you can identify where you fit mm. on that by looking at the most distant known ancestor information. Question here? Um, that, sure, um, if you tested your father, obviously you're going to get your father's Farrell, 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 Farrell line. Um, if he's not alive anymore, then you could test a brother or a male cousin that actually carried the... It wouldn't change the DNA. wouldn't. It wouldn't change the DNA because uh, the, you'd be looking at the Y chromosome, uh, but you're, you're on your, the other Farrell on the on your father's mother's side, you'd have, if you wanted to find out what feral DNA that person was carrying, you'd actually have to find a male relative of that person and test them. And what you might find is that they probably are matching. So they, they probably go back to, this, to a common ancestor, um, but it might be 200, 300, 400 years ago. Does that kind of answer your question? Sort of, okay. Um, Hugh. Morris, I just want to clear. Is everyone in that group, you may have that common ancestor from 14? Yes. 15. Yeah. Okay. And, and it, it stands to reason because the person that invented the Farrell name had sons who had sons who had sons. There was a line of descent. And what we can say is that the, the people in this group, the DNA is saying they have a common ancestor that goes back to 1400. That's as far as the DNA is able to um, estimate for now. But of course, as more people join, we might go back to 1300 and 1200. In my Gleason uh, group too, from North Tipperary, I was very, very lucky because we got a Gleason who was on a very, very ancient branch of the Gleason family tree. And when we did the, the dating of, of the Gleasons of North Tipperary, we actually got back to around the 1000 AD time point which is when the name would have first been uh, introduced um, and then it would have taken maybe a century or two for it to become commonplace in the area in which it was introduced. So we were very lucky. Hopefully we get the same with the Farrell of Group 2, that we get an ancient branch that uh, allows us to actually go back much further than 1400. So question here. There were so few people around, you'd be Patrick from the field, or you'd be Morris from the mountain, or you'd be um, One-Eyed Jack, or um, Dim Dave, or <laughs> Four-Eyed Stan. You know, so they, they had ways of uh, you know, identifying people, just like we do now, actually, um, uh, because there were so few people around. The surnames, um, Certainly in England, the reason for that surnames became so popular was for tax purposes. They needed to identify people. And so a lot of the surnames you find in, in England, and also in France as well, will be uh, John of Gaunt, uh, Thomas of someplace, uh, William de Courcy. Uh, so you get that of, and the same in Welsh surnames as well, uh, they, ha they have ab, meaning from, uh, or descendant of. Uh, they'll have John Thomas's son, uh, William, son of Patrick, uh, Fitzmaurice, Fitzpatrick, that type of thing. So that's how they identified people back in the old days before surnames. And like I say, in Ireland, surnames were introduced at a, at a relatively early time point, around about the 900s going into the 1000 AD. Uh, it caught on later in um, England and on the continent. And in some parts of Wales, they only introduced inherited surnames in the 1850s. Hmm. So very, very late. And before that, they were, they were using the patronymic system and changing it every generation. Um, John, Evan's son, Evan, Peter's son, Peter, uh, <coughs> Joan's son, that type of thing. Question. 
It could very well be. It could very, very well be. And if that was the case, what you'd be looking for is a genetic association between some mackerels and some fowls. And we found, we found this actually with the harrows. And there, within this group, um, that there is this genetic connection between the harrows and the fowls, which, of course, you wouldn't think intuitively there was a connection. But when you look at the way that the surnames evolved, you can see that uh, O'Farrell in Gaelic, when it's, you're aspirating the, the F, and you get to put FH in there, it goes from O'Farrell to O'Arrell, and you get Harrell from that. So the next question is, where do they sit on the big tree? And several people in the group have done the big Y test, and you can see the results are here. And on this, uh, this gives us the terminal SNP BY28646 for this person, these two people here of A770, this person down here has BY28646 again. That's the, uh, the SNP marker that places them on the tree. On the second page, we have some more people doing either the big Y, a SNP pack, or a single SNP, and we get these additional SNP markers here, uh, Z17685, and these two here. Where do these sit on the tree of mankind? Um, there is uh, BY28646, there is A770, there is Z17685, BY32840, and FGC20561. So you can see that the DNA, the SNP markers from group 2, are making them con um, congregate on this particular branch of the tree of mankind. And their nearest genetic neighbours are York, Roderick, Devoy, Christie, Miller, Reynolds, 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 and Hazelton. Does that mean something? Let's find out. Not everyone has uploaded their data to the big tree, so we need to harvest more names for our nearest genetic neighbours by going to the family tree DNA haplotree. And this tells us that there are four people uh, at BY28646, nine people at FGC20561, which is here, and we can garner more names and fill out the tree like this. So now these are the various surnames associated with this, these various sub-branches of this portion of the tree of mankind, but not everyone has done the big Y test, so we get more surnames by going to the Haplogroup project. Just out of interest, here are the dates. We're going back to 500 AD here. McKenna is about 1000 AD. Hazelton, 1050. The Reynolds, about 1200 AD. Uh, McCormick and Devoy, about 900 AD. And the Farrells at the Ruth and the Kelly, about 1400 AD. So that just, so you see what's happening now? We're actually being, we're able to put ourselves on the tree of mankind and we're able to date each branching point on that tree and where the various names uh, diverged from each other. So going to the Z253 haplogroup project, we get additional names to add in to our nearest genetic neighbors. We've got Fegan, we've got Cain, and that's just a, a way of harvesting as many names for our nearest genetic neighbors as possible, and this is what we get. This is the harvested name of our harvested names of our nearest genetic neighbors from the big tree, from the, the, the big Y matches page on family tree DNA, and from the Z253 haplogroup project. These are the branches on which they sit, and these are a whole list of names. Question is, do these genetic matches correlate with anything in the documentary records, either surname distribution maps? or the surname dictionaries like Wolf, are the ancient Irish annals. And when I did this exercise, I made some very surprising discoveries. Where do these people come from? Where do they, uh, who are these people? Is there a link to documentary data? Are, are some of these names just surname or DNA switches that have happened along the way over the last 1,000 years? So is there a link between these genetic neighbors and the paper records? And these are the sources we're going to look at, the surname distribution maps, the surname dictionaries, the ancient annals. 
And the surname distribution maps I use are on forebears.co.uk. It uses 1881, 1881 for the UK data. It uses the 1901 census for Ireland. But this is after the Industrial Revolution, when all the country folk will have moved into the towns and they'll have brought their surnames with them. So the distribution will be muddied by a lot of noise. And we won't necessarily be pointing at um, a pre-industrial revolution location for these names. But that's overcome by John Grenham's uh, maps, which are based on Griffith's valuation, which took place largely in the 1850s. Uh, it only reflects Ireland, but it's probably better uh, to uh, reflect the rural distribution of particular names. So I'll run through these. The first name on our list of uh, nearest genetic neighbours was Geraghty. And look, the highest concentration of Geraghty is here in Longford. The next name was York. And look, the highest concentration was in Longford. So now our closest genetic matches for group two are pointing to Longford as a place of origin. This is Roderick doesn't tell us anything. This is Devoy, a kind of a South Leinster name. This is McCormack. It's kind of everywhere. But McCormack, highest in Longford. Um, this is Fegan. Again, maybe some suggestion of Cavan and uh, West Meath, which are the neighbouring counties. Uh, this is Kane. This is Christie. This is Miller. This is Robbins, this is Neil, this is Brogan, this is Kelly, this is Reynolds, this is Hazelton, and this is Austin. So it's only really Geraghty and York, maybe McCormack as well, that kind of point to Longford, um, and there they are again. There's uh, Geraghty, there's York. Um, there's a warning here, of course. If you torture the data long enough, it will confess. <laughs> so I'm just a little concerned that I'm cherry picking. You know, and it's, it's very, very difficult to make that judgment. Are we actually being pointed towards Longford? Or is it just wishful thinking? Because of course we wanted to go back to Longford. But how do you control your wishful thinking? That's, that's always a challenge that we face, battling with our bias. But if we look at the surname distribution maps from the 1850s, again, Farrell, even in the 1850s, Farrells were everywhere. So they moved about quite a lot before the Industrial Revolution. Geraghty is more of a Midlands kind of name going over into Connacht. York is only in very, several specific places, and Longford is very much one of them. Why is that? Surely York is an English name, right? So what are the English doing in Longford? York is not an English name, it's an Irish name. I'll show you why. There's also on John's website, you're able to look for two names together. This is Farrell and Geraghty in Griffith's valuation. This is Farrell and York in Griffith's valuation. This is Geraghty and York in Griffith's valuation, all of it pointing to Longford. So there's some suggestion here of an association between Farrell, Geraghty, York, and the Longford area. If we look at surname dictionaries, York is actually from Maconchra, which is an Irish name, obviously, and uh, it's probably been anglicized to York. It is found chiefly in the Midlands. So now we have evidence from the surname dictionary that York is actually a Midlands name. If we look at um, Geraghty, we can see that it is common in Connacht and also in parts of Leinster. If we look at McCormack, we can see that they were, it's an abbey, uh, they were in the barony of Longford. And initially you think, oh, this is great. It's not, because the barony of Longford is 80 kilometers away in Galway. It's <laughs> nothing to do with Longford at all. But you would think, oh, this could be proof. It's not. And then we look at the final one, Reynolds, and this is where you fall off your chair. Reynolds are from the same stock as the O'Farrell, who were chiefs of Winter Ullis in the south of County Leitrim. So Reynolds 
according to the surname dictionary, is from the same stock, the same genetic stock as the O'Farrells, and that's why we're seeing Reynolds as a nearest genetic neighbor to the Farrells. So here's a summary of the surname dictionaries. York is in the Midlands, Geraghty is in Roscommon, McCormick, there's no link, but McCormack seems to be around, well, the, from the surname dictionary there's no association, but Reynolds is from the same stock, so there is some genetic neighbours have a link to the Longford area, and they have a link to those, those particular names. Farrell and Reynolds are now linked together. So if we go to the ancient annals, and we look at what they have um, uh, written, we, we, we look at O'Hart's Irish pedigrees, which are the or origin and stem of the Irish nation, published in 1892, but it was from Linea Antiqua. He copied it almost entirely uh, from Linea Antiqua, uh, which was written by Roger O'Farrell back in 1709. And um, what I haven't done is I haven't compared O'Hart's version to uh, Bartiaski's version, and I haven't consulted Leora Morn and Nailock. So I'm making the assumption that O'Hart's version is relatively accurate. I get the feeling that uh, there are some generations missing when you look at these uh, ancient annals. I also uh, am aware of the fact that a lot of people would describe Hart's uh, distant pedigrees as somewhat mythical. King Milesius of Spain, for example. But the more recent ones, in the last couple of hundred years, are likely to be relatively, um, the last thousand years, relatively uh, okay from, from, a, from an accuracy point of view. But we also have to bear in mind that a lot of the time the annals were used for propaganda. And uh, they, people wanting to belong to a certain name so that they could get prestige or wealth. So we have to be careful about how we interpret the ancient annals. But uh, O'Hart has O'Farrell, uh, number one pedigree, as the princes of Annaly. And uh, Fergal is number 105 on the line of Ear, uh, was the ancestor of this family. Um, the, he was uh, king of Conmacna and was slain fighting on the side of Brian Baru at the Battle of Clontarf in 1014. So if he died fighting in 1014, he was what, maybe in his mid 30s, let's say 34. Uh, that gives us a, a date of birth for, of about 980, plus or minus 10 years for this chap, more than likely. So if he was born in 980, and if you go all the way back to the stem of the line of ear to Milesius of Spain, who is number 36, there's 70 generations between Fergal and King Milesius of Spain, giving him a date of birth of approximately 1100 BC. So we're looking at uh, quite a, we're looking at 2000 years of, um, of uh, history in these um, ancient annals. Now I'm not going to go from King Milesius all the way up to the Fergals uh, to 105. I'm going to skip to 105. And here is Fergal. Here is the uh, ancestor of the O'Farrells. But if you go back to his father, grandfather, great-grandfather, great-great, great-great-great, but go back a couple of generations, you find out that his ancestors gave rise to a number of different families, including the Finnegans, the Shanleys, Mulvey, Mulcairan, Gilligan, Quinn, Gaynor, Reynolds. And we have a genetic link to those Reynolds. Uh, Kenny, Brannigan, Martin, Breddon, Biran, Canavan, Bernie, MacBurney, Daly, Moran, Kerrigan, Kerwin, and Sheridan. So you can see that a whole variety of surnames are associated genetically with our O'Farrells. <coughs> and you can also put rough dates when this uh, uh, branching apart would have occurred, going back to 770. Big question is, do these names that we see as supposedly related to, to the O'Farrells in the annals, are they among the nearest genetic neighbors we have identified from the DNA? And of course, the obvious one there is the Reynolds. We've identified 11 Reynolds that we are related to genetically, and Reynolds appears as a supposedly related surname in the ancient annals. Question here. If the Longford Farrells 
take their name from the king of Conrad Nay who was killed in Plantar. Fergal. Where do the Tyrone pharaohs get their name from? Very good question. Um, I don't know, and I don't think it's recorded in the annals, but it's certainly not recorded in Hart, because he only talks about the Longford pharaohs. The pharaohs from Tyrone, the pharaohs from Wicklow, and all of those other variants, a lot of the time there isn't this amount of information about them in the ancient annals, because they weren't as prestigious a family as the pharaohs of Longford. So we're lucky that the, the Longford pharaohs were a prestigious family because we have, they, they've been documented historically. Um, so this is what we get from, the, the, uh, from our heart. This is where the various names would have branched off. All these Sheridans, Finnegans, and so on. So we're seeing now, that we're able to answer the question, do the genetic neighbors appear in the ancient annals? And the answer is very emphatically yes. We are seeing Reynolds. In the, uh, among the nearest genetic neighbors. And the common ancestor was about 860 AD. But we can also look at it the other way around. Do the names that we've just seen in the ancient annals, do they have a counterpart in the DNA? And for that, I searched the Z253 haplogroup project, and I found that there was a connection genetically with Sheridan, which was on the, who's on the S846 branch, which is a couple of branches higher than our Farrells. There's also a genetic connection with Kenny. It uh, comes across as McKinney, McKinney and Kenny with, uh, without the E. And there's also a connection with Quinn, and they are on an adjacent branch to our O'Farrells. So there is, again, some evidence that the names we're reading about in the ancient annals have a genetic counterpart among our nearest genetic neighbors. So, is this a chance finding? I would say probably not. And I think when you take all of the evidence together, there's probably a very, very good chance that we are the Farrells of Annaly, and that we actually can claim this pedigree that O'Hart has, going all the way back to Fergal, as our own. And that's because we appear in surname distribution maps close to Geraghty and York, our, what, two of our closest genetic neighbors, Reynolds are described as coming from the same stock as the O'Farrells by Wolf, and also O'Hart suggests that the Farrells of Annaly have a common ancestor with Reynolds around about 860 AD. The supposedly related surnames in the Annals appear as relatively close genetic neighbors to group two, and I'm talking about Sheridan, Kenny, Kenny, McKinney, and Quinn, and taken with the the birth location of the most distant known ancestors of group two, six of whom go back to Longford, I'm reasonably confident to say that um, this group two is the Farrells of Anley. So how did the Farrells of Anley over time, evolve over time? If we go back to the annals, we can see that coming from 980 down in time, they gave rise to the Levies in 1100, in 1190, uh, Orley was living in 1268. His daughter, Ranald, married Hugh O'Connor, King of Connacht, and was drowned in a bath in 1248. It's hmm. very specific information, isn't it? Yeah. <laughs> we come down further to 1220, uh, where the O'Farrells of Ballin Ali broke away as a branch in their own right. Uh, the Farrells of Grenard uh, broke away in 1370, O'Farrells of Edgewardstown in 1400. Um, actually, that's corrected to 1490 because we actually have a date in the annals. So we're, 30, we're 90 years out of sync because I'm assuming 30 years per generation, which is a pretty good estimate. Um, the O'Farrells of Wee and the O'Farrells of Longford broke away in about 1550. And then that brings it down to 1730, which is about right. It, it corresponds with what the annals are saying. Then O'Farrell pedigree number two is the O'Farrell born. Um, they um, arose around about 1280. And then we have the O'Farrells of Rathline. They arose around about 1220. And then we have pedigree number four, pedigree number five, the O'Farrells who were chiefs of Clan Hugh and the O'Farrells of Matreya. And again, uh, the chiefs of Clan Hugh gave rise to the O'Farrells of Caltra and Corlee. So now we can have this Farrell pedigree here. This is the branching structure of the Farrells of Anna Lee, and you can see 
that Rath line were the first to break off around about 1200. Uh, the O'Farrell born around about the 1300s and the O'Farrell Bui around about the 1600s. So the O'Farrell Bui would be maybe second cousins to the Farrells of Longford, third or fourth cousins to the Farrells of Edgewardstown, fifth cousins to the Farrells of Granard, uh, seventh or eighth cousins to the Farrell born. So you get an idea of how these different Farrells evolved over time. The question is, is this structure seen in the DNA results? The short answer is no, but I'll explain why. And I'll run through these very, very quickly because there isn't a huge amount to be uh, gained from this exercise at this point in time because it lacks the fine detail that we need. Um, ideally, everybody should be doing the big Y test and upgrading their markers to 111 markers. But that costs a huge amount of money um, around about, I'd say, it would, you'd, you'd be spending around close to a thousand US dollars to actually do that. But over the course of time, this kind of thing will happen. And if we get that fine detail, we should be able to um, either prove or disprove that this is how the O'Farrells evolved over time. But certainly this is the current map of the O'Farrells that the ancient annals uh, have painted. Now, do any of the local Farrells know whether they're from O'Farrell Bourne, O'Farrell Bui, or one of the other lines? Any O'Farrell Bui in the audience? I would John, so. John would I think. Would be sure, sure, yeah, I mean, you know, best guesstimate. Yeah. So we got one, two, three, four O'Farrell Bui. Any O'Farrell Bourne? One, two, two, yeah, two O'Farrell Bourne. Any O'Farrells from any of these other lines? You, you think you might be. Well, we know we're from Tyrone. Oh, you know you're from you're from Tyrone. Yeah. So Joseph uh, Farrell immigrated to the United States in 1835. So from you, County Tyrone. Oh, okay, okay. So you could be from that rare branch of the O'Farrells in Tyrone. But I, I've seen the County Tyrone O'Farrells referred to as a branch of the Longfords. So it gets more complex. It does get more complex. Um, if they were, you'd probably see it in the DNA. Unless there has been a surname or DNA switch but along the line. We have very weird DNA that doesn't seem to match anybody. Yes. Yeah. Except Egypt. <laughs> <laughs> you know, in a historical context, uh, Morris, how much did the Christian name be passed down? I noticed there was a line there that um, Hugh would have noticed there was a Hugh back in the 1600s, but on the William, there was only one branch that had a William. Uh, did, did the Christian name pass through as well? Um, it would do, but it was very, very much uh, family specific because Irish naming convention was the first son is named after the father's father, the second son after the mother's father, the third son after the father, the fourth son after the father's eldest brother, the fifth son after the mother's eldest brother, unless there was a death in the family and the son, first son died, the second son was a replacement child, would be named the same name as the first son. Unless that second son died, in which case they turned the back of their hand towards the ancestors. I don't know the expression in Gaelic, but they turned the back of the hand towards the ancestors, and to break the spell of bad luck, they chose a name that was completely foreign to the family. Isn't that interesting? It's fascinating. Um, the Scottish had a slightly different naming pattern system, but that's what they did in, in Ireland. So that's how this, the, the Christian names were passed down. 